please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Lalit Dringa. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. And thanks for having me here. Um, thanks, Elizabeth, for a uh, nice introduction. I was never introduced like that. Um, <clears throat> And by the way, we got a great weather for you. It's like Europe. If you walk in Europe, it's like you know, similar weather. So um, in my today's talk, um, I'm going to talk about mostly about what's happening in uh, today's industry in terms of data. <clears throat> and then before that, it's, um, it's interesting to know my story, uh, why I'm here, and um, what I've done uh, in life so far. Uh, somebody said 38 years. I was counting when she said that. Um, I don't look that old, right? Um, <clears throat> so about me, and a lot of you may not know about NIT or NIT technology, so I thought instead of just introducing the company, I will talk about the strategy behind why this company exists and how this company started. So. Um, that's, that's what uh, I'm planning to cover, and I will definitely shut up after 40 minutes and you know, give 20 minutes to you to, to ask questions. Um, these slides are just the placeholders. Don't try to connect my words with the slides, um, uh, because if you do that, um, you will get confused. And uh, when I put this presentation together, I remember somebody telling me, um, I hate PowerPoints. You know, there was a mentor of mine, he said, I hate PowerPoints. So you should have pictures and then you speak. Um, I didn't have too much of time to do that, so I went into my corporate thinking, let's have PowerPoint. <laughs> so, so about me, um, I was born in Delhi, India. Um, shall I tell the age? 1957, 10 years after the India got independence. Um, I didn't look like that when I was born. So, <laughs> so this is, you know, a lot of people know Delhi and this is, uh, you know, the kind of houses uh, used to have. So I was born in one of those, those houses and born to a family, which is uh, my dad uh, used to work in the postal department. So I learned a lot of interesting things from him. And my mother was teacher, so I was more disciplined at home. So, and she was a principal of a school, so you have to be very careful um, while doing wrong things at home. So um, education I had done, um, graduation in mathematics. Um, in a college, this is, uh, this is a very interesting college. Hansraj College. Um, how do you relate Hansraj College? Some of the, you know, the people from India will know. This is where Shah Rukh Khan studied. But much after, I, Shah Rukh Khan is one of the, the Bollywood star, right? And um, that's where I studied my maths. And then I did my operations research post-graduation in um, University of Delhi in Mathematical Sciences Department. Then I did um, my master's in technology or electrical engineering um, in IIT Delhi, which is one of the premier institute in, in India. So this is where I spend a lot of my time, uh, definitely a lot of my time on the first two and then some time uh, doing research, doing uh, technology work in, in this company, in these institutes. And then, um, obviously, at that time, the way the economy was, you study and you need to get a job. That's, that's important. That's, that's the routine that you work for whatever you have studied. You have to apply into your job. And I tell you, whatever I study, I couldn't apply. Um, and that you know, raised a question, um, what, how do we connect academic with the uh, with the actual word, what happens? So that was the, the learning I had in my first job, which was uh, a company called HCL. 
which was at that now the HCL is known for something different. At that time, it was known for um, building computers. They used to call 8-bit computers or 16-bit computers. Now you carry much more powerful computer in your pocket. But at that time, in 79, uh, I was lucky to get involved in the innovation or research and development of very interesting stuff. So it was, um, so I wrote um, machine language. Uh, I did machine language programming. I wrote, I don't know how many of you know, uh, C++ and Java, some of you who are uh, the IT uh, from technologies. So I wrote the compilers for those in those days in, in, in 79 to 85. I really enjoyed what I did, but I kept on thinking what I'm applying, what I studied. And that is, uh, that I came to know when I went to the next job. So after six years working in computers, systems programming, uh, solid technical work, I moved to a company called CDOT, which was a new experiment by government of India to get youngsters to build um, first digital switch for India. That was a very, very prestigious organization to, to work for. And um, that is where I found my mentor. And uh, he was the head of that company and he actually, he's the one who hired me in that organization. And I was very, very um, thankful to him because that is where I said, this is where I want to apply what I learned, like operational research, um, some of the work I did in my mathematics uh, graduation. And I built um, the front end from scratch to when the switch was completed. And this front end was basically a computer system which does, which administration, uh, does the administration job for the switch as well as does all the billings for the telephone. So it was 16,000 line switch. I mean, I know some of you uh, may not be really aware of what happens, like the people who have a landline, how the landline works through the switch is what I was working for four years in that company. And I did really solid technical job uh, again there. That's the time when I said, you know, it's 10 years, I've been doing same thing, I get bored and I wanted to do something else. <clears throat> so I did some separate things um, or parallel things when I was in CDOT, I was uh, interested in writing articles. So I started writing articles and then I was um, positioning them into the newspapers or magazines and that is where the thought of becoming an editor came up. Can I be editor of a magazine? Um, and then somebody says writers don't get paid well. So that love of mine was uh, put aside and I went to explore the world and say what else I can do. That's where I met um, the chairman of NIIT at that time who was looking uh, to do something different in his organization. And that's how I landed up in the job which I am uh, still having. So I joined this company in 1990 and still counting. Some people say it is, you're crazy. And um, some people say, are you going to retire there? Um, so I always say that I love what I do. And as long as um, I do what I love, I will continue in that place. Um, it's a very interesting um, transition for me. So I moved from a real technologist who was only job is to think about new products, new ideas, innovations, systems programming to a leadership role. And that transition is the most important learning of my life. And that's, I think, uh, some people say that we are the technical guys, how do we become uh, the CEO of the company or if, if only, uh, if we can become CEO only if we uh, found, you know, we're a founder of a company. That's not true. I found uh, places within the organizations where you can take a leadership role and leadership role doesn't come up by saying that you have to be a C-level person. The leadership is what you perform. 
So for example, in the company in CDOT, I took the leadership role and said, let us do the front end system for the switch. It was not planned for initially. So you take that and you become the head of that particular division. I went to NIT and said, you guys are doing something different. I want to do this. Do you think I have a person to do it? They said, yes. That's called entrepreneurship. So you can pick up something and you can build it. And once you build it, you are a, the CEO of the ac action which you have done. So you don't need to be a C-level person or call the title to become what you want to. So that's, um, that's my story so far. There are other things, the life was tough. In those days, I know um, you won't even imagine 70s or in, in 70s what used to happen. Um, we came from, I came from a very modest family uh, and parallelly I wanted to, I want to try new things. I also tried uh, when I was not able to pay uh, my school fees, I tried uh, work in a restaurant, right? And that was a great experience. Somebody said one night, there was an event, they said, okay, you are supposed to be making omelets today. I said, good. I thought it's a cold night, people will not, you know, everybody will not come and eat omelet, but on that day, I made 400 omelets. So, and uh, now I came to know I could have worked in Waffle House, <laughs> right? So, um, you learn because some, you know, 400 omelets is a big thing. I mean, you are tired after making 400 omelets. That's, that's, uh, that's a great story I have when I was paying for my bills for my graduation. And that was the last day I worked in the restaurant because it was tough. So, so that's me. Um, so just to tell you that um, what is the uh, strategy of NIIT, which is, uh, which is a company where I started working in um, 1990. So if you, if you just go a few decades back, so the, there's, a, there's a strategy for, uh, for people to think why, why the, why the company is what the company is today. So there are, I, I will cover it in four decades. So the first decade is when, just think about, just imagine, because you, you, you were all born after, hopefully after uh, 1980s. So if you look, that is a time, the first time in 1981, people had seen computers outside of the glass doors. See, when I used to work in my school or college, then the computers were behind the, the glass door. We could only see it. We can't touch it. It's a mainframe, the big mainframe, the IBMs and Honeywell and all those systems. 1981 was when PC was born. When you see, look at it, a PC is born. It is on the machine on your desk. What are you going to do with it if you don't have skills? And India at that time was in a... Uh, it was a closed economy. People didn't have skills to work on the computers, but somebody is going to push the IBM PCs there. So there was a good market for us to go and start teaching IT, which is the information technology to the people. So that is where the thought of NIIT came up. So some people may uh, ask the question what NIIT stands for. It used to stand for National Institute of Information Technology. Like the IBM, nobody remembers now what IBM stands for. So, so that is where the NIIT was born. And that is uh, the first, if you look at it, the first big jump. Objective was bringing people and computers together and afterthought was successfully that how do you bring people and computers together so that you can teach them, they can learn from it, and then you can, you know, you can have jobs created for them because that is how uh, the industry worked at that time. Now, what's the strategy behind, behind this? So we didn't go for, here is a school, let everybody comes in and learn information technology. We went to where people were. So the strategy was go, 
where people are. So various cities, you go and set up centers and you go and teach and people learn from it. And then you set up a place where you want to headquarter and that's how the company started. So it was more of an education organization or education company which is actually creating jobs for the people, youngsters who want to learn a new subject. That was the strategy behind um, setting up. And, and that was a time when, see this is the first time somebody called education as a product. Because education is never called a product. It used to be a very holy word that you go learn from your teacher, come back and apply. Now the education as a product because it's a for profit. It's not non for profit. So that is how uh, we started. And then how do we globalize it? So every, every company out of India wanted to become global. How do you become global? So we used a uh, number of things uh, in becoming global. And this is one of the method, one of the strategy. So some founders of the company came to US and looked at McDonald's. And it was everywhere. So we said, um, it's simple because it's a pro there are multiple products in McDonald's and everybody is, you know, it's a franchise model. So we were the first company in Asia who franchised education. So we said, okay, uh, if McDonald's can do it, we, we can also do it. So we actually invited people and say, okay, now this is how a center looks like. This is how the courseware looks like. This is how the examination will have at one particular centralized place so that you have a quality control. So we kept the quality control and we kept the designs and say, okay, this is how you will go and um, uh, teach people. So that's, that's what we were called with an article in those days, we were called the McDonald of education, IT education in India. So that was a franchise model that took us outside India. We went to Southeast Asia, Singapore, China, and uh, Bangladesh and all those places where we had um, that is one method of, for us to globalize. Um, was it a success? Probably not that what we wanted. So, so people who do the strategy work, it's not necessary that you copy McDonald's and you become uh, the globalized. So we had our lesson learned in that. Uh, today we are successful because now we have, you have to adapt like McDonald adopted when they went to India, they didn't have beef, right? So they adopted. We first shot, we didn't adopt. We went to each country assuming everything will work the way it should. And that's a lesson which we learn in our strategy of franchising. And then um, it was a good, good expansion, good learning, uh, not, the, not the greatest of the success. We felt that's not a well thought through strategy, but uh, it worked uh, to a certain degree. So that was globalization through uh, this thing. Then now comes the next decade. See, every, why I'm talking about decades? Because if you look at it, the, the technology and the environment of the business changes every 10 years. That's what they used to say. Now it changes every year. Because um, the, the industry is moving much, much faster pace than um, it used to. I call it as a, we live in a dog year. We're living the dog life because it is so quick. Things are moving so fast. In the first 30 years of my career, I have not learned much than what I've learned in the last two years. Because things are moving around you so quick. So that second, second uh, decade, we said, okay, now we're to change the strategy a bit and try to understand because that's the time when I joined the company and we came up with this model of um, uh, teaching hospital. You, you, you all know what teaching hospital means, right? Um, so you have a medical school and you have a hospital attached to a medical school. The students learn uh, from, uh, from their school and they go and apply in the hospital, right? So, and whatever they learned in hospital, they come back and say, look, this is what we should put in our, um, in our class. So this is a model we came up with. We said this is a model we should use it because now we are in software business also. If you're in software business and you're in education business, you have to connect these two. So we were kind of a knowledge company. 
So which means that you, you train people, use them into the software, right? And now we have extended model to become digital. So how you can use education or training? How do you use the software? And how do you make things happen in the digital world? So that's the model we came up with. It's, we call it as a, a teaching hospital model. Uh, so that was uh, very, very, very famous uh, in those days. And um, so we learned with it. It was a great model. It gave us a lot of success in those, those days for, for us in, uh, in both the businesses. And then uh, a very interesting study came up <coughs> in 20, uh, by McKinsey. So McKinsey study uh, said this. They said, if you look at the workforce, in 2020, the workforce in the world has this situation, which is that you have a surplus workflows in India, and you have not so much of workforce and so much of demand in the other company, which is workforce in terms of information technology. I'm talking all in terms of uh, technology uh, workforce. Now, this was a very interesting chart. So, which, which said, how do we strategize our business that wherever there is a shortage, we can go in our education business and create more resources. And we can use the resources which we have surplus in India to create a model of using them in, in creating applications or creating the outsourcing business. So, that was the third. Um, uh, strategy of the company of globalization. We said focus on developing countries for education business and focus on developed country on the software business. And that's what we did. <clears throat> and that has given us um, what we call as a greater success story of NIIT in terms of globalization. So what, uh, what we did in, uh, so I moved to the software side of the business. Before that, I was in both sides of the business. So I moved and had the business in the US because that was the largest market from our perspective. So once we move here in the US, we said, okay, what do we do? I mean, you can't just go and say, okay, we'll do, we'll do the business. How much you know about the market? What should be your strategy? What are you selling? What are you... Uh, what is your core competencies? I moved here in 97 um, and unfortunately for, for me when I was putting the strategy together, we were trying to roll our things, the 9-11 happened. And, um, and we were focusing on two, two kinds of organization at that time. The organizations which were focusing on Y2K, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you know the Y2K problem. Right, a lot of you. So the Y2K problem was that, okay, you have a large systems, I don't know what's going to happen in the turn of century, and a lot of companies came up with tools, technologies to fix the Kabul bugs, right? That's, that's the Y2K problem. It's a big problem uh, to solve at that time. Um, I was part of the strategy, and, and I took a decision that probably that's not the right thing to do. Um, probably, e-commerce or doing something in the e-business will be more sensible because youngsters who are coming out of the schools may not like to work on COBOL, may like to work on the new technologies. And that strategy backfired to us, to be honest with you, backfired to us because our competition focused on, uh, on the large the big programs and doing Y2K and they build the relationship with the customers and they went through. Whereas we went through creating a lot of platforms of the frameworks on which you can do the e-commerce. Probably we were ahead of the game, but we're not going with the market. So the learning which we had was try to look as a market and say, learn. you go where the market is going, but that's the strategy we took. And then we modify our strategy a bit and we said, why it has gone there? Did I do anything? Okay. So, so we said that now, I mean, this, this chart is not related to what I'm saying. So I'll just go forward. And so now we created a company 
which is a software company or an IT technologist today is around 410 million dollars keep on changing based on what is the dollar to rupee exchange rate. Um, and we have 10,000 people, we are in 18 countries. Um, I manage the, the, the Americas business, which is around 46%. You know, if I do the quick calculation, I know 189 million or whatever. So how did we reach here? So 2000 is when we said our strategy cannot be just doing the old programs which we are doing. So we changed our strategy and we said, Biggest thing is the focus and differentiate. Do few things which you, uh, and do them well. That is the learning which we had is that, don't become generalist, become specialist. So we became a specialist in three industries, financial services, travel industry, and um, retail and manufacturing. So that's where our bulk of the business <coughs> comes today. And we sometimes we the large deals which comes up, we don't take them in the other. Like we don't work for oil and natural gas industry, or we don't work for utilities, we don't work for government. So we are very the strategy for us is um, focus and differentiate, and that's how we set up the company here. We said, what is our vision? Our vision is to become the the first choice to our customers. Be the first choice. That's important for us. Then, um, and then it is, the mission is to manage data or manage information better. So help our customer to manage information better. Um, and that is where I'm going to spend the, the next 10 minutes on a lot of people are interested in what's going on in the data. And then how do we create exceptional customer value for our customers and help them growth. So it's not that if my customer is, for example, Delta Airlines, then I should create value for Delta Airlines customers, not for Delta Airlines. And that means once I do that, by managing their information better, then we should be able to, they should be able to grow and hence we should be able to grow. That's what it means. And then strategy is very clear, focus and different, Fo keep focusing on few things. Sales guys don't like focus, I don't know how many, if you want to become a salesperson sometime, so one thing you should learn is not to focus. Because the sales guy says, if I want to successful, I want to see where the dollars are, I have to sell. So it is very, very difficult job for a leadership to tell the sales people to focus, right? So, so that's what my job is to, to tell people. So how we globalize this organization? So there are the stories, um, I'll keep them short. So one is you acquire companies, right? Then you can become global. Suppose you are in the US, you want to become global. So I actually went and acquired a company in Manila. I had never been to Manila and said, you know, we acquired a small little company uh, in Manila, very specializing in travel business. Then you can do joint ventures, which is uh, what we did with a company in Georgia, which is in Augusta. I knew Augusta only for golf um, and ended up doing a joint venture there. So that's another story. Then you can buy a large unit of a company in some other part of the world. And the fourth was to start up operation in, in that country. So we have, I'm lucky enough to do all four. So um, you can ask questions and if you want to know more about those things. So how did we de-risk our company? So you can de-risk if you are, suppose if you're in the US and you're doing 90% of the business in the US and something happens to the economy, your company is going to go down a bit. So we did, um, as an organization, we de-risked and we have 46% coming from the US, 34% coming from Europe, and 20% coming from Asia Pac. Right. And then we de risk through our services, which is financial services is 38%, travel and transport is uh, 36%, and media and others is 26 But Very interesting story why we did that, and we, um, the analyst loves us, because um, uh, when 9-11 happened, which was the industry which went down like this? 
travel and transport, right? And actually, every industry went down, but they went down like crazy. So we survived as a company because we had some other verticals in which we were focusing on. Now today, what do you think about travel and transport industry? It is the industry which is like this today. Why? The oil prices are the lowest. And the biggest operational cost for an airline is the oil. Right? So they are the most profitable industry now. So that is where we think our business is going to grow faster than anything else. Which industry went down in 2008 after this is financials. So we balance it out with the other industries. So we kept our de-risking strategy very clear. And then now, um, let me um, talk about the topic which I have sent that, which is very dear to my heart. One, because um, people have always used data as, um, as a research topic. You know, and then um, what I feel that data should be used in your daily life because data is what you come across every day. Um, see, if you're if you're on a Facebook or how many how many of you go to Amazon, <laughs> right? So interesting thing on Amazon when you buy something. So when you're buying something and when you're actually checking out, so what happens in the last uh, row? That people bought this and they bought this also, right? So how do they, how do, they do that? How, how is it possible that, and they're pretty accurate, right? They're very accurate. And they keep on sending you advertisement based on based on what you have been searching, right? So it's all around data, and which is a new topic, which is called digital. So what, two years back in our company, we said, uh, okay, the whole world is going to go, you know, if you, this whole, um, this hype, the word hype is very important. I know if you uh, know Gartner, Gartner is very good in creating this hype cycle. They are the one who will just create, you know, say hype cycle, this is where the technologies are, this is where the word is going and all those things. Why they call it as hype cycle? Because it's hype, <laughs> right? So it is a hype till you implement it, till you put that into your use. So what we said, if every word, a word is going to a digital is not that because the technology is taking you towards that word. I mean, I came from a world where a uh, few, 20 years back, we didn't have a mobile phone in India. And today, people have two or three, right? And so pe people look at how the people change or the businesses change when the environment is, environment is change. Um, there was a joke in CES. Um, so remember they come up with a, a new belt called Welt. How many of you know that? It's a, it's a Bluetooth enabled belt, right? Samsung. <clears throat> and that bell tells you that you're eating too much, right? So <laughs> that's funny. And then they have a Bluetooth suit. It fits you and as soon as it start not fitting you, you are gaining weight. So it's interesting stuff. I mean, so the guys are going to sell that wealth, interestingly. I mean, you'll know what's, what's going to happen on that. But so what is happening? Technology is moving on a faster pace. Environments are changing. So today, whatever you're calling application development or software development is going to be digital development. Everything has to be on mobile and has to be on your, your machine, uh, at desktop, at laptop, at iPad, at and they should all look alike. That's, that's what the word is going. And the second, the data, so look at it, what is happening? So a lot of, uh, year back I was giving a presentation and somebody asked me, so what, do you, what is your opinion about cloud technology or what is your opinion about mobility? I said, they're, they're going to stay because they're forced to stay. 
you cannot have huge data uh, servers for the amount of data you generate. The, you know, that's, that's very important. So it has to be, you know, it has to be, the cloud has to be there to stay. So we have to focus on, not on technology, but on the businesses in that environment. So that is the strategy which we are using in 2015 uh, in NIIT. I did uh, hire somebody from the government, um, from the securities, the government when you know, terrorism and all those stuff which these guys do, they are the best guys who understand data. You know, the NSA understand data much more than anybody else today. So, and this guy and I, we, we came up with some very interesting concepts, which I'm, uh, not concepts, actually the, the case studies, which are very, very useful in today's environment. And that's what um, my guidance to every student today, don't look at research of the data, look at how the data needs to be used, right? Give another example. You, uh, how many of you know Allstate? Everybody, right? Most of you. Now, you are using Allstate and suddenly you decide to write to him on Facebook, I hate Allstate. Maybe something went wrong, right? So, now you're an Allstate customer and you don't like them. Allstate doesn't know it. Similarly, in this room of 50, 60 people, Allstate doesn't know how many will leave me tomorrow. They don't have a clue. So they came up with a program in which they use the data effectively from within their systems and outside the systems, which is the Facebook and, and Twitter and all those places, and say, okay, how many people will have probability of leaving Allstate? That is the problem one has to solve because the cost of adding a new customer is more than the cost of retaining a customer, right? That everybody knows that, you know, if, so now what Allstate has done, if I, if he, if Allstate knows the 30 of you are going to leave it, they're going to have marketing plan 30 for you, for you, give you discounts and get you retained as a customer, correct? So that is the kind of things which one has to do. So we, uh, this is called customer churn in the, in the industry uh, segment which we are in. This is called customer churn. So I know customer churn before it happens. That means I know what's going to happen tomorrow. So that's what uh, our strategy has been. This is just, um, don't look at it. This is um, uh, the slides which, um, which are used by many, many people in the world today. So these are not my slides. These are all, uh, I, I paid and got, got it. This is where you say, okay, if you, how the data is, how many trillions of data is used? So what's so big deal, right? So, so much of data, but what do I do? What is called, where is the relevant data? So before that, I just wanted to put this, I love, I don't finish my presentations without having Gilbert in my presentation. So just want to uh, leave with that, what is this word big data means today? Um, so, Instead of this, we should, we should look at it and saying what data is making sense in the market you are in. So if you're in insurance market, if you're in travel market, what data is important for us to be used? So I just take this example of all set because we're doing something with them and that is the customer churn. Then there's another thing which is, so I, I just want to put here, what is the this is just a slide for you to know that there's a big data is the data which you which you have the volume velocity and of the data and relevant data is the one which you should look at it how do you get the relevant data from the big data you have that is what we call the science behind it that is where people are spending money to say how do i get relevance of the data people may not if you want to know my data People are not interested in what I did in India. They're interested in what I did in the US. That's the relevance. So how do you create that relevance is where you should focus on, not focus on the huge thing. So that you can focus on by defining 
what business case you are going to solve, for whom. See, all state is interested, tell me who is going to go, leave me. Newspaper guy tomorrow, New, uh, New York Times want to know how many customer I will lose, I do not know. The banks want to know, are you living at the, see, are you living at the same house? Bank does not know that you have changed. How many of you go to bank and tell them, look, I changed, I changed my house. How many of you go and tell? So, the bank does not know what is, what is happening with you. They can send you a form and say, please just fill this form and update if you are changing, they request you. So, how do, how do these businesses know or something called know your customers? Once you know your customers through the data, then you can apply any business case. So, focus on that is those business cases. So, I just want to give the theory to the, the practical stuff which we are trying to do. So, what have been done? If you look at it, it is hindsight. What has happened? So, I can do a statistical analysis and that is what the reports are. So, this happened in 1990, this happens in 1995, this happens in 2005 and that is the hindsight. This is a past experience and based on the past experience, we can do uh, to understand what may happen today. The, the, the weather channels used to be do that. In 20 years, that is how, how the pattern is going to be and this was uh, 10 years back how the temperatures were and this is what we expect temperatures will be in this, this that is the hindsight. Then you have the insight and then you have the what we are talking about is digital foresight which is saying that how we can apply the data to the business. That is the difference which we are bringing. So, it is, uh, it is knowing your tomorrow today that is what our concept is. This is what uh, we as a strategy in the company were changing it rapidly um, to, to go into giving very actionable intelligence to the people. Right? We, did an, we did a very good study for a company which wanted to, uh, to hire brokers for wealth management. And they said, we are looking at Massachusetts. So, we look at Boston, one particular area, 5 million people and we narrowed down to 300 people who have the possibility of becoming a broker. So, the company does not have to send or broadcast to 5 million people, they have to broadcast to only 300 people and from 300 people, we actually worked and told them that 180 had illness, which is uh, Illness in the sense that, which is, it is not HIPAA compliant issue, it is basically illness that these people may not be able to become your broker. So, you are left with 180, right. And out of which we said, how many are single wealthy women? They had more potential to become your brokers. And now, that is what we call actionable intelligence. That is what the word is going today in data. If you are able to do that, connect with the business, you want to set up a company like that, great place, right. So, that is what is happening in the world. <coughs> now, I just want to focus on this, um, I may have 5 more minutes, so I will uh, finish this quickly. I think if you just look at what has happened in the world, <coughs> so if you look at 2000, I just start from the 2000 how the business was done or pre-2000. There were people who go and sell, right. So, it is a people and you optimize the relationship with others to sell or make business happen. What happened in 2000, past 2000 a bit, the web came in and what were you doing with the web? You are not selling through web. What were you doing through web? You are actually trying to promote your businesses on the web, right. That is where we are extending relationship now. It is not people to people, I can broadcast this to many people. That is what was the second. Uh, the third, the e-business era started in 2005, which is saying that you have people, you have businesses and you are optimizing channel. So, I got another channel to sell, right. That is a time when airlines started to sell their tickets through the website. 
how airline used to sell if you look at pre 2000 they have they have agents through which you can buy the tickets right hardly people used to go to airlines office and sell it right they used to optimize relationship with people and they can sell it now in 2005 they said okay i have web channel so i'm going to sell through through website that is the extending or optimizing channels now what happens <coughs> then the digital marketing you want to buy tickets so there is a very interesting case there is an airline which says i sell everything and by the way i sell tickets too there is a very interesting airline right you you will be surprised it's a small airline which says that i'll sell everything and by the way i sell tickets too that is what what they are saying is there are multiple businesses i can sell a watch i can sell anything i can sell car rentals i can sell hotels and i can sell merchandise and by the way i also sell the airline ticket so that is my last way of doing thing right so you, you go to jet blue you go to all the smaller airlines they are actually selling merchandising and somewhere you will try to find how the you know how i just go and buy a ticket between new york and atlanta you know that's what uh, the world is going towards optimizing interactions between businesses right that's where the digital world comes in they're going to market every product through the channel which they have that's what the world is today that's where the digital digitization is happening right it's practically and then uh, as i said the wealth example i gave it to you that is nothing but now you add a business e-commerce and things right so you have intelligent so they they came up samsung was a very interesting uh, place <laughs> in the cs they had a tele, uh, they had a huge screen on their one door of um, refrigerator that tells you what is the refrigerator temperature and how your stuff is inside is going to be like that all this is connected through wifi right so now look at the business of warranty you go and say i buy an iphone and i have a warranty i buy a computer i have a warranty i buy a refrigerator i have a warranty for it now they are saying if all these things are connected then i can have a single consolidated warranty for you that's how the cars the homes the appliances right this is called iot which is i think most of the technologists may know that that is the next way the business is being done and the, the last which is the business is called autonomous business this is where it change the way the business is going to look at things is um, maximizing every channel every relationship every optimization and that is what the world is going to go in 2020 uh, so that's i was very fascinated by if somebody i have put it very simplified version for you to really understand um, but it's it's fascinating so if you look at the if you look at the business part don't look at the technology part technology is by the way that's behind it but it's a business which which needs to be running i'll give you i this is my last example i love this example um this is a travel example so how, how many of you travel i think everybody right <clears throat> what is your if you're traveling international let's take an example you're traveling international and you go to atlanta airport so what all you do we call it as a journey so journey starts from where from your home till you reach somewhere else where you have to reach so there is a source there is a destination there is a start there is a end now this if you are able to sell something to me when i'm traveling what is the best time for me me to buy things very good one of the example is on board so this actually tells you when you are less anxiety when you are relaxed then you are going to buy it so if you say i check in my anxiety level is what little higher i don't know she'll say oh your suitcase is heavy take something out right you can't take this put your liquid in or whatever right so you have this anxiety level 
once you checked in the anxiety level gets very high when I'm in security immigration, right? I don't know, I'm in a queue, my anxiety level goes up. And then once I am out of security, I say, oh, this is great. Now I'm relaxed. So that's why you see so many shops in airport doing business. So you eat burgers also, you do, you spend money when you are at the airport and you have time. And then your anxiety level goes in the boarding. Why, why is not boarding? Why is not boarding first? Why is boarding the kids first? Why, you know, why I'm not first class? So all this anxiety comes in. And somebody tries to sell you something there, are you going to buy? No, right? So you're boarding and then you're taking off also anxiety. Oh, my God, you know, it takes off properly. So no, and then once it takes off, you're at 35,000 feet, you're relaxed. So that's why they sell uh, stuff in the international flights when you are relaxed. And then when you're landing, your anxiety is very high. I hope it lands, you know. And then once you land, you're at the airport again. And once you're past immigration and all, you say, no, let me buy something, you know. I have not bought something for my family, so you still have a possibility of buying things. And that's how, and then you transfer into a taxi or whatever it is, and you're home. Um, so I think this is what we call a very, very interesting journey. It's called journey map. So once you do the journey map, now you see how I can use digital in selling my stuff at the relaxed time. And for any business to succeed, if you're able to draw this, you're successful, right? Uh, that's what I wanted to cover. Um, I hope it was useful for you. I, I'm open to question and answers at this time. So I have a question just to get it started. So you talked about how the business um, de-risks itself to go into different markets across the globe through globalization. You've also done a really great job of talking about where data and businesses are going, where they've been, where they're going, and where they're going to go in the future. So keeping that in mind with um, NII, NIIT, what, what businesses I know, you, I know you want to be specialists as opposed to generalists, but what kind of businesses are you excited about um, for the future that NITT, NIIT is interested in? And where is that in the world next? Where are the opportunities for NIIT? So for us, the opportunity is in obviously, you know, why I put the travel business, because we know this business very well, and that's the business we are doing. That's, I think, is a number one business, which we believe that the data can be heavily used and uh, the businesses can, can be linked with data. The second is insurance industry, which is actually laggards in technology. I mean, they are not, you know, they have the monolithic systems and uh, so there's a big opportunity for a company like us to, to go and uh, make a difference to them. The third, obviously the retail industry, which is very, very savvy on um, digital today. Um, if you look at Best Buy or look at some of the equivalent of Best Buy, they're doing fairly well. So that's the third industry which is going to be uh, very, very interesting for us to, to look at. So that's uh, three industries I can see. I don't see financial industry in terms of banks. Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, but I think these three we are, we are focusing in the U.S. Hi, are you able to hear me using, okay. My name is Ranga, I studied at NIIT back in India, so thanks, it got me here. <laughs> but then again, quick question on the uh, strategy regarding your balanced portfolio. I understand you have a major presence in uh, financial services and travel. So back when you entered US, what was your plan or strategy? How did you decide that these two are the main chunks that you want to have in your portfolio? Very good question. Actually, that's what I said, that uh, strategy changes every time every five years, two years, now it changes every year. Um, when I moved to the US, we were horizontal. <clears throat> we were providing projects in um, Java technology or C technology or uh, the SQL. So it was horizontal, there was nothing vertical. So then we said, okay, where are we having skills? 
So we chunk the projects and say, okay, this we have done for British Airways, this we have done for, um, let's say, Virgin America, or this we have done for, you know, some of the other companies. So we chunk those projects and we realize that if you have 100 people, we are having bigger chunks in, in travel than the others. So we, we said, okay, travel is one industry we should focus. And when we are focusing, then you need to get the skills and you get the skilled people in that industry to make that happen. So that's how we went. And then in the financial services, we were doing some work with the, uh, with the asset management company. We said, okay, we're not doing anything with insurance. We have no client, customer in insurance. Uh, and we got the first customer in Atlanta, it's what we call ING, now it's called Voya. So from there we build up and say, okay, now we have 20 customers in the US in insurance. So that's how we build up over a period of time and now we can very proudly say that, okay, no, this is a strategy. But you didn't think through when we started off. So if somebody says, okay, I have a great strategy and I work on it, it doesn't work. My opinion, my, I may be a uh, you know, bad case, but that's how it worked. Well, you Yes, that's how we built it. You're in three major markets in the United States, Asia Pacific, and Europe. Could you compare and contrast security, privacy, and identity theft in each of those markets and where you see the challenges, the downside part of big data? It's, uh, I think it's the same across. <clears throat> it's Does it even include legislation at all? And no, the, the challenge is the same. The problem is the same, right? How you tackle with the problem is different, right? Um, so the Europe tackles is differently than, than the US, right? US is very, very particular about uh, security, but still we had so many thefts. Um, I think the industry is focusing not on, um, so the industry is worried on one point across the globe. We don't know how many thefts are happening and we don't know about them. That's the scary part. Somebody says, okay, uh, the target got uh, impacted by security, the data got stolen. I think that's an easy problem to fix because you know that something happened, I can put a gate on it, right? The problem which industry is having today is that they don't know what is, what is happening and we are not aware of it. So I think there's a lot of research being done today is, is to look at it, how do you prevent it? So I, I think each each unit is looking at from that perspective. So, so follow on, when you move to the Internet of Things, does the security, what, how does that change your security and privacy challenge? It's a similar way if I do any data, right? So, if, so let's say if I'm able to today, see if you put some data on Facebook or on all those things, right? Now the data is available. Now you're saying your devices are also available. You have to make sure that there is a more security before you get into the IoT of things. There has to be uh, different security levels which has to come in. That's, that's what I... Uh, hi, Mr. Dingra. Uh, thank you for your speech. So when you uh, talk about the adaptation, when you expand the company globally, could you give us some examples of um, what changes you made to do it differently with respect to different uh, part of the world? Thank you. See, there is a one fundamental uh, learning which we got was, um, it's called, we, we use a word called global. I don't know how many of you know this word called global. Be global, but act local, right? So which means that wherever you go to do business, you have to look at what the local culture is, what the market is, and you have to have people in the organization who understand that culture and be part of it. So that is why if you look at our strategies, so we acquired some companies, we, we did something different than a lot of other people who have done it. So you have to act locally. You don't have to bring in all your global processes and say this is going to work because each, each country works differently. <clears throat> 